may post questions and comment, comments in the Q&A panel. And the moderator will draw from these questions and comments in conversation with the presenter. Please review the guidelines on tobaccopolicy.org for acceptable comments. Please keep the comments professional and related to the research being discussed. Comments that meet the seminar series guidelines will be shared with the presenter afterwards, even if they are not read aloud. Your comments are very much appreciated. This presentation is being video recorded and will be made available along with the presentation slides on the TOPS website, tobaccopolicy.org. I will turn the presentation over to today's moderator, Mike Pasco from Georgia State, to introduce our speaker. Today, we continue our spring 2022 season with a single paper presentation by Dr. John Oliver entitled Impact of Smoke-Free Air Laws and Conventional Cigarette Taxes on Cardiovascular Hospitalizations. John Oliver is an economist in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Planning Evaluation. His research focuses on tobacco and opioid policy, as well as the factors affecting drug pricing and biosimilar drug development. He earned his PhD in economics from the University of Illinois at Chicago in 2018, and was previously a postdoctoral associate at the Yale School of Public Health. Our discussant today is Dr. Xi Sheng. Dr. Oliver, thank you for presenting for us today. Thanks, Mike, for that introduction and for uh, TOPS allowing me the opportunity to present my work. Um, I will, my slides here, hopefully that's now visible. Okay. Um, so, uh, like Mike said, this is my paper uh, that was recently published this year on uh, the impact of smoke free air laws and conventional cigarette taxes on cardiovascular hospitalizations. Okay, minus out the uh, so a quick disclaimer before we get going, um, the findings and, and conclusions in this presentation are solely those of myself and do not necessarily represent the official position of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Um, this uh, research has no funding sources to report, and I have not received any tobacco-related funding over the last 10 years. So before we get started, uh, just to make sure we're all on the same page, um, brief uh, outline. First, I'll talk about some background information. Um, give you a sense of where the, the literature stands on smoke-free air laws and its effect on uh, human health, um, provide some motivation for this research before talking about the various research questions that I address. Um, we'll go into the data and methods used in this study before moving on to some results. And then finally, um, go over some conclusions and implications. So uh, some background uh, information that I'm sure this group is familiar with. And you know, tobacco use is associated with more than 480,000 deaths annually each year. Um, and this includes uh, deaths related to both active smoking and secondhand smoke. About 10% of this number is deaths from secondhand smoke. So non-smokers um, are largely affected as well. Uh, conventional cigarette smoke is a leading risk factor for heart disease and stroke. Um, you know, because uh, cigarette smoke enters the bloodstream, it affects nearly every organ in the body. But um, particularly heart, uh, heart disease and stroke are, are large, um, large diseases that, uh, that affect a large number of Americans. Um, there's also an elevated risk among both current and former smokers, as well as due to secondhand smoke exposure. So, um, uh, you know, findings from this uh, 2010 uh, Surgeon General report um, find that these elevated risks do decline with time since quitting. Um, and return to baseline levels after about five years. So this varies depending on um, the type of disease we're talking about, but um, there is benefits to quitting smoking, even if you're you know, a lifelong smoker or uh, just someone who has just picked up the habit. Um, so if we're thinking about policy moving forward, um, it's good to keep that in mind um, that you know, there are uh, health benefits uh, from smoking cessation. So in response to, you know, these large numbers of deaths, policymakers at the local, state, and federal level have turned to smoke-free air laws and conventional John, cigarette John, taxes. Yeah. John, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, there's some request if you could speak louder, please. Sure. Um, so uh, in response to this, uh, policymakers at the local, state, and federal level have turned to smoke-free air laws and conventional cigarette taxes to increase the cost of smoking. So <clears throat> this is both if we're thinking about cigarette taxes, the monetary cost of smoking, 
Uh, but in terms of smoke-free air laws, this could be a social cost of smoking. Um, you know, if you're not allowed to smoke indoors, you have to walk outside in the winter. Uh, there's some inconvenience associated with smoking. So each of these essentially are trying to reduce the number of people that smoke. Um, smoke-free air laws first began in the U.S. in the 1970s at the local level. So this was individual cities, counties implementing smoking bans. Uh, whereas the first uh, cigarette taxes occurred at the federal level way back in the 1800s, um, and states followed suit in the early 1900s. Um, collecting data for this project, um, I was kind of surprised to see um, one state in particular, um, I believe it was Alabama, started collecting um, like local and county cigarette taxes in like the 1940s, 1950s. It was usually like one or two cents per pack of cigarettes. Uh, but they haven't changed since then. So they were an early adapter of uh, cigarette taxes, but um, not much movement has occurred there since then. Um, and as you can probably imagine, there's large differences that exist across states and counties in terms of both smoke-free air laws and conventional cigarette taxes. So uh, this presents a, a good opportunity to study how these policies affect uh, human health. So where does the existing evidence stand on tobacco control policies? So this is just, um, I'll say up front, a, a small sample of the large number of studies that have looked at smoke-free air laws and their impact on human health. Um, some of the single city studies tend to find the largest results. So um, early work uh, by Sargent et al. finds a 29% reduction, uh, right? Yeah, 29% uh, reduction in acute cerebrovascular disease, which is a stroke. Um, and I believe that was a paper that looked at the acute myocardial infarction, which is a heart attack, finding a 40% decline after smoke-free air laws were implemented. Um, Follow-up studies looking at state level, comparing uh, you know, a few states here to a few states there, find 8% declines in acute myocardial infarction and 18% declines in acute cerebrovascular disease. So um, as the population tends to grow, uh, previous studies have tended to find smaller effects. And then with nationwide samples, so this is either looking at, um, you know, like two dozen states or using uh, Medicare data. Um, previous research has found anywhere from a null effect to a 21% decline in acute myocardial infarction. In terms of uh, looking at smoking behaviors, uh, smoke-free air laws are associated with reduced smoking prevalence from 2.7 to 3.0 percentage points and up to 3.8 percentage point increase in smoking cessation, as well as uh, 1.2 to two fewer cigarettes smoked per day. So um, from these laws, we're seeing that not only are fewer people smoking, but the people who continue to smoke are smoking less. In terms of conventional cigarette taxes, uh, among high income countries, a 10% increase in the conventional cigarette price is associated with a 4% reduction in smoking. So if we're thinking about how each of these policies impact human health, um, we can break this down into essentially a direct effect and indirect effect of each law. So for smoke-free air laws, the direct impact is a decrease in exposure to secondhand smoke, right? If you ban smoking in restaurants, what's gonna happen the next day is that there's less smoke in that restaurant. The indirect effect of that policy is to reduce conventional cigarette consumption and smoking prevalence as well as increased quit attempts. So people are more inconvenienced now, they have to go outside to smoke, there's some social cost of smoking, and so they smoke less um, and, they, and fewer people smoke. For conventional cigarette taxes, this is essentially flipped. Uh, the direct effect here is a reduction in smoking prevalence, conventional cigarette consumption, and smoking initiation. So the price of cigarettes goes up um, and fewer people are gonna smoke and smoke less. And then the indirect effect here is decreased exposure to secondhand smoke. If there's fewer people around smoking, uh, then uh, the people around them are not going to be as exposed to secondhand smoke compared to before the policy was put into place. So uh, the motivation, you know, maybe this uh, is not as necessary for this group that's already interested in, in tobacco policy, but um, as we all know, active smoking and secondhand smoke are hazardous to human health. And as of last year, only 62% of the US population was covered by smoke-free air laws in all public venues. So what I mean by all public venues are workplaces, restaurants, and bars. 
um, and state conventional cigarette taxes are as low as 17 cents per pack. Um, there's a whole bunch of other states that have, you know, a cigarette tax near there. It's less than a dollar. Um, so there's there's a lot of um, you know work moving forward to expand each of these policies. Also, the current health outcome estimates are largely based on either hospital specific data, looking at single city, uh, single city studies, or comparing a few states here to a few states there. Uh, but uh, nationally representative results are needed to guide future policy moving forward. So uh, the research questions that I uh, attempt to address here are how do smoke free air laws and conventional cigarette taxes affect population health nationwide. So in order to do that, uh, I'm going to examine hospitalizations from 2005 to 2014 in counties that did and did not enact smoke free air laws and cigarette taxes both before and after these policies are put into place. Um, also, I'm gonna look at not only just the, the overall population, but specifically, do these effects vary by age? So um, for each diagnosis, I'll estimate the impact separately by working age adults, so those ages 18 to 64, as well as older adults, which I define as ages 65 up. And then finally, um, estimating whether these health effects change over time. So um, I'll rerun the regression that I'll show in a minute uh, separately by whether a smoke free air law is new, so occurring in the first year after implementation, or whether it's an established law, which will be all years after that. Um, so this will, will determine uh, you know, the immediate effect from any delayed impact and whether um, you know, the effects kind of peter out over time or whether the health benefits grow after people are no longer exposed to, um, to smoking in workplaces, restaurants, and bars. Um, the outcome data I'll use, um, I know we're gonna, oh, we wanna take a break after. Um, sure, sure, that, yeah, that's fine. Um, uh, maybe I'll invite the, um, the, the discussant, uh, uh, Si Sheng, uh, to come on and if she has any questions at this point. Uh, yes, great. Uh, I think uh, I just have um, some um, overarching questions. Um, so I know that this is already a published uh, paper. So I guess my question is, um, how did you pick the outcomes? Because there are many measures that could get at cardiovascular disease or health. And you are looking at uh, quite extreme cases like heart attack and uh, strokes. And, um, and also hip fracture. So I'm just wondering, can you speak about why you chose these outcomes and what would be the next outcomes you will be looking at? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question. So originally this started a few years ago with my dissertation research. And so I did collect data on a, a much broader range of outcomes. Um, there were a few um, cancer diagnoses in there, breast cancer, um, asthma, COPD, respiratory ailments. Um, the ones that uh, stuck around for this paper, um, heart attack and stroke, uh, I chose mainly because they affect the largest number of people. And so um, the findings there might be the most interesting, but um, there's certainly other um, diagnoses that could be looked at uh, that could be just as interesting. Yeah, yeah sounds good. And um, I guess I have a similar question regarding uh, your stratification by age groups. And can you also like uh, like maybe discuss more about why you choose these two different groups? Are there any like underlying health reasons because um, uh, heart attacks and strokes are more likely to happen among older adults, or is it because the smoking prevalence is quite different uh, between those two groups? So just some thoughts of, <laughs> about the uh, stratification. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so as I'll talk about in a minute, um, usually obtaining this data gets very expensive very quickly um, and working on it as a grad student, um, you know, without uh, any funding available. Um, it was basically these two groups were uh, detailed enough to provide some contrast between them um, while also um, being not a big ask for data vendors to supply me with the data. So, um, you know, ideally you could split it up in a much uh, a much larger number of age groups or just provide patient age at the individual level and then you can split it up however you like um, 
but it was generally because this is the data that I could get. While also being, you know, interesting enough to, to have a, a fairly clear split between working age adults and then the 65 plus population. Um, yeah, um, I also feel like maybe the insurance will be different. Um, I mean, the implications of um, how they're treated. But anyway, I think there is a Q&A, three Q&As. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Um, uh, John, the first question here in the Q&A, uh, is there any similar data available re-indoor uh, vaping? Or how would we think um, about indoor, indoor vaping? Yeah, so I mean, you certainly could look at um, these same health effects or other health effects as a result of, say, indoor vaping laws. Um, there was the transition in 2015, the third quarter of 2015, from ICD-9 codes to ICD-10 codes. Um, so I think you'd have to see, one, if there's a good mapping mechanism to, to chart the number of, say, heart attacks or even asthma hospitalizations from ICD-9 codes to ICD-10 codes. Um, but yeah, this, you could certainly replicate this project examining um, more recent data resulting from indoor vaping laws. Um, another, another question here uh, relates to um, uh, casinos. Um, is that a venue that uh, where you're studying the effect of the um, indoor smoking uh, restrictions in uh, casinos? Um, and could we expect you know, the health effects to be similar or different there uh, as well? Sure. So I don't examine casinos here. Um, the the only venues I, I look at are workplaces, restaurants, and bars, mainly because these are the places that most people would be exposed to conventional cigarette smoke outside the home. Um, I would imagine that the impacts would be similar in casinos, probably smaller because there's not as large a population affected by um, or exposed to cigarette smoke in those locations. But um, you know, if you were able to observe, um, you know, say individual level data for people who are in casinos before and after these policies are put into place, I would ex expect there to be some health benefits of smoking bans in those locations. But um, just because the general population is not as exposed to smoke free air laws in those locations, um, they were not included in this analysis. And uh, any data on uh, how the increased cost of living for lower income smokers to taxes influences their ability to afford hospitalization? Um, it's not something I incorporated here. Um, I mean, I would, so because the outcome data that I have is I only observe people who are, uh, you know, brought to the hospital and admitted for one of these conditions. Um, if someone, say, could not afford um, medical care and, and stayed out of the hospital, um, it seems like if you have a heart attack or stroke, right, you're, you're going to the hospital. Um, if you didn't, um, you would, I wouldn't observe you in this data set, but, um, as long as that doesn't change along with these policies, um, it shouldn't, I wouldn't think that it would affect the results. Um, but yeah, if, if someone's unable to afford hospital uh, medical care um, and you know had heart attack and stayed home, then, then they would be omitted from this analysis. Okay. Um, great. Well, those that that clears the uh, uh, the Q and A. Um, I guess one one just question that that I had, or I guess observation of for or maybe a rationale for why you chose to focus on uh, these outcomes. Is it fair to say as well that unlike outcomes like cancer, these two outcomes they're they're more immediately affected by the um, uh, uh, the policy change in which we could, you know, very quickly after the policy change, we could expect to see changes in these types of hospitalizations, whereas other types of health outcomes you may look at like cancer, especially there would be more of a delayed uh, effect. Yeah, um, and you know, along with smoking cessation, you know, 
right after you're exposed to conventional cigarette smoke, your blood pressure goes up, um, you know, the nicotine hits your body and you're affected right away. And so once you cut that off, um, there should be an immediate decrease um, in some of these negative health effects. Um, the reason I didn't include other um, immediate diagnoses that might be affected like asthma, things like that, um, is just because it was a cardiovascular focus of this paper. But yeah, both the stroke and, and heart attack should be affected right away. And then we would think also some health effects down the line as people are no longer exposed. Okay. Um, audience, please continue to add your, your Q&As to, uh, uh, to the panel. And John, please continue with your presentation. Great, thanks. Um, so the, the outcome data that I use in this analysis is gonna be hospital inpatient discharge data from up to 40 US states. So this comes from public health departments, hospital associations, and the healthcare cost and utilization project. Um, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, you know, this study doesn't have any, any funding sources to report um, and was started as part of my dissertation. Um, and so essentially, you know, the healthcare cost and utilization project collects all of this hospitalization data from um, it's about 35, 40 ish states um, and sells its researchers. Um, you know, working without funding, I had to go then track down this information state by state. Um, and so, um, you know, lots of uh, IRBs and, and things like that to, to collect all of this. So, um, the primary diagnoses of interest were uh, limited here in this analysis to acute myocardial infarction, which are heart attacks, deep cerebrovascular disease, which are strokes. And then um, I also include one diagnosis to serve as a specification check and that's hip fractures. So uh, there's no reason to think that hip fractures might be related to the passage of tobacco control policies. And so uh, when I show the results, we would not expect there to be any significant changes uh, due to hip fracture. Um, each of these uh, diagnoses were identified by the primary diagnosis code using HCUP's clinical classification system. So this clinical classification system basically takes a group of ICD-9 codes and uh, bundles it together to form one code that is say acute myocardial infarction. Um, and so uh, each of these data requests to um, these individual states was for um, the single um, clinical classification system code for each of those diagnoses. Um, the individual states provided this hospital data at either the individual level or county level. Um, if the data was received at the individual level, this uh, contained the diagnosis code, the admission date to the hospital, the patient's age, and then patient county of residence. So either using FIPS code or zip code, and then that information was used to map it to, to a county. And then uh, before analysis, these observations were aggregated to the county level for each diagnosis and age group. So how many heart attacks occurred in this county during this year in this age group? Um, other states, if the data was provided at the county level, this was essentially pre-aggregated by the data vendor to the county year level for each diagnosis and age group. So um, everything was then at the, the county year level um, before uh, before analyzing it. So uh, the policy variables of interest are going to be first smoke-free air laws in work sites, restaurants, and bars <clears throat> with a uh, few or no exemptions. So um, we can think of these as either qualified or comprehensive laws. Um, the exemptions might include things like a, a size exemption or <clears throat> smoking is only um, allowed in separate ventilated rooms. Um, previous research has found that these qualified laws do are associated with some health benefits. So that's the reason for their inclusion. Um, and typically not very many uh, venues qualify for these exemptions. So um, <clears throat> this data comes from the American Non-Smokers Rights Foundation database and the US Census. And so using the implementation date of each law, along with population data, I calculate a percentage of the county population that's covered by smoke-free air laws each year. So for example, if County A enacts a worksite law banning smoking in worksites, 
on January 1st of 2008. Here the entire population is covered and the coverage spans the full year, but only one third of the venues are included um, in this coverage. So here the smoke air variable would equal one third. If instead we think about um, a policy enacted at the city level, so city B in this case, that's located in County B, if they enact a smoke-free air law in worksites, restaurants, and bars on July 1st of 2008, we're assuming that um, only a portion of County B, County B's population is covered. So City B is the only city here doing anything in this county. Uh, there's no other laws in place. And the coverage would only span half a year, but it does include three out of these three venues. So essentially um, the smoke-free air variable here um, would be half of uh, half of what it would be in 2009. So it's going to be um, a fraction. It takes into account the city's fraction of the county's population, as well as how long the policy is put into place. So in reality, you know, County B might have 10 cities in it that are implementing a smoke-free air law. And so at the county level, it's going to factor in the total population covered by a smoke-free air law in each venue and the percentage of the year that it's in effect. Um, for conventional cigarette taxes, these occur at the local, state, and federal level. And this data comes from the Institute for, uh, Institute for Health Research and Policy at the University of Illinois at Chicago, as well as individual statutes. So uh, this was essentially you know, cold calling, basically hundreds of, of cities uh, trying to get their ordinance data on when cigarette taxes were implemented uh, and the price of the tax. Um, and using this information, I essentially follow the same um, outline as for smoke free air laws to calculate a single tax value at the county level, incorporating both the implementation date and the population data. So it's basically like a, a weighted average of all of the taxes um, in a county that are weighted by the relative populations affected. And so additional covariates I use, um, population estimates come uh, for age and race come from the US Census. To control for economic conditions, I use median household income data from the US Census. The uninsured rate here, the uninsured rate is the percent of the population under age 65 that is uninsured. So this comes from the US Census's uh, Small Area Health Insurance Estimates Program. Um, also to control for economic conditions, I use the unemployment rate and CPI data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And then as kind of a catch-all to control for other um, tobacco policies that might be happening during this time, I use state level uh, data on tobacco control funding from the CDC state system. So the, the regression that I'm going to estimate here is a Poisson model um, that's going to look at the relationship between tobacco control policies and cardiovascular hospitalizations in County C and year T. So I'll run this regression for each of those diagnoses, heart attack, stroke, and hip fracture. And um, here, you know, the, the two primary um, policies of interest are this SFA law and SIGTEX. Um, the X sub CT is going to be a matrix of county characteristics that I mentioned on the previous page. And then alpha C and delta T are going to be county and time fixed effects. And then all standard errors are clustered at the state level. Next, I'm going to replace the measure of smoke free air laws with two variables, new law sub CT and established law sub CT. So here, each of these is going to be an indicator new law is going to take on a value of one in the first year um, that the average smoke free air coverage in a county is greater than zero so this could be a law in, of any type workplace restaurant or bar affecting any level of population within that county so once it goes from zero once the sfa variable goes from zero to any positive number this new law variable takes on a value of one and the established law is going to equal one in all subsequent years after that. So this will capture any health benefits over time um, after these laws are put into place. 
And then as a specification check, I'll separately estimate the impact of smoke-free air laws for each individual year leading up to and following implementation. And I'll uh, plot the coefficients on a, on a graph to see how they change. Here we would uh, expect um, these should not differ from the baseline in the years leading up to a smoke-free air law being put into place. Um, you know, if there were higher heart attacks in the years leading up to a smoke-free air law, we might think that you know, a county implements a smoke-free air law because of the poor health of the population. Um, so hopefully we'll see that, that um, hospitalizations do not differ from the baseline in the years leading up to implementation. Okay, so uh, this first table shows some summary statistics uh, by whether uh, counties at any time from 2005 to 2014 implement a smoke-free air law. So um, in columns uh, one and three, we have counties that through the end of 2014 never implement a smoke-free air law. And then in columns two and four, uh, these are counties that do at some point implement a smoke-free air law. And what we would expect to see here, hopefully, is that counties that do enact a policy and counties that do not uh, don't differ significantly, um, at least in their observable characteristics. So we see here that maybe it's no surprise, you know, there are um, in columns two and four, fewer acute myocardial infarctions and acute cerebrovascular disease uh, rates among counties that do eventually implement the policy. Um, but they're, they're still pretty, pretty similar. Um, and hip fracture, um, you know, especially among the, the ages 18 to 64, these are essentially unchanged uh, with whether a county is in the treatment or, or the not treated group. And then uh, this uh, next page of summary statistics is essentially the same as, as the previous slide, but here showing the observable characteristics of counties that do and do not implement the smoke-free air law. And so we see in this first row, uh, CC tax is the conventional cigarette tax. Um, in both 2005 and 2014, we see that counties that at some point implement a smoke-free air law are also implementing a conventional cigarette tax. Um, and the same is true for state tobacco control funding in the second row. So uh, this kind of reiterates the importance of also including a control for each of these policies, because if not, the effect of those policies, if they're implemented alongside smoke-free air laws, their effects will be absorbed by the smoke-free air law variable, and smoke-free air laws might appear more effective than they actually are, because they also contain these um, unobservables like cigarette taxes and state tobacco control funding. Um, you know, the rest of the, of the observable characteristics here are, are pretty similar. Um, and so, you know, that should alleviate some concerns that uh, there might be unobservable factors that we're not controlling for here. That might be different between these two groups. We want to pause for yes. questions or should okay. I? Uh, Okay. That sounds good, John. Um, yeah, I'll turn it over to, to C for any discussion comments. Thank you, John. That was great. Um, I guess I only have some uh, clarification questions regarding how you constructed the variables. I guess the first question I have is about smoke free air laws. Because if we read literature, you know, uh, in the early work, uh, authors often talk about whether it's a 100% um, comprehensive smoke free air laws. Because in the early days, there were policies that uh, uh, are banning smoking, but with exemptions. So I'm wondering um, how you addressed that issue, or like, are you looking at only the hundred percent without exemptions, or you know, how do you how did you code this variable? So, so this includes both, um, or I should say, either a qualified law, which are those with exemptions, mm -hmm. or comprehensive laws, which are one hundred percent. Um, smoking bans, no smoking is allowed. Um, the reason I included either of them is due to previous research showing health benefits arising from qualified laws. So once a qualified law is put into place, um, there is research showing that there are fewer um, adverse health events in the years following those policies. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, relatively few venues, uh, bars, restaurants, workplaces, are eligible for those exemptions. So, um, 
so there, I think there's value in, in including a qualified law or a comprehensive law. Um, you know, also counties, cities and counties um, tended to implement qualified laws before they implemented a comprehensive law. So if I ignore qualified laws and I just look at 100% smoking bans, they might not appear as effective because some of these health benefits are already happening earlier in time when the qualified laws were put into place. So using either of those policies, I think better captures the actual health benefits resulting from a smoke-free air law. Yeah, I think, you know, sensitivity analysis may also help with different like coding strategies. And um, my other question is about your outcome, because I know that uh, when using like a personal model, there are like several cases where it's looking at just the counts. So basically the number of diagnoses, or it could be weight. So I'm just wondering which one you used and why did you choose to use, um, you know, count outcome versus like rate outcome? Yeah, um, so here I used the count outcome. Um, and essentially, uh, because I was able to get the actual number of, um, I mean, I, I, I could have used a, a rate as well. There wasn't, you know, a clear preference for one or the other. Um, mm. I think, you know, getting mostly individual level data and, and knowing the actual number of heart attacks and strokes in each county, um, it seemed just uh, like a, a natural extension to, to go ahead and use the count. Uh, yeah, I would, is, is yeah. my outcome, but I, mm. you know, it could be run as, uh, as a rate as well. Yeah, my my guess is that the results wouldn't change much. It's just like we interpret it, have to like convert it to uh, correspond with the outcomes. Uh, those are all the questions I have. Um, let's see if there. So I'll pass it on to Mike. See if there is any Q and A. Or... No Q and A at the moment, uh, but please keep adding them, and uh, let's proceed with uh, seeing the results. Great. Um, so. Here in table two, we have uh, the first set of results. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, uh, so we have uh, one more set of summary statistics and then we'll look at the, the regression results. So here, um, we might be concerned that people are sorting to counties based on some, you know, say health preference, which might also be related to their willingness to implement a smoke-free air law. So this table compares um, the hospitalization rate one year before and after these policies are put into place. And for our outcome variables and the observable characteristics on the next page, we would expect these to hopefully be the same if people are not sorting to counties. And then, you know, everyone moves to one county and says, hey, we want to implement the smoke free air law, which then affects uh, the outcome variable. So uh, this should hopefully alleviate some concerns that people might be sorting into counties based on some unobservable characteristic, which is related to a smoke free air law implementation. Um, and then on this next uh, page, we see again, you know, each of these observable characteristics is essentially the same. Um, and so uh, we might be less concerned that there's some unobservable factor here that's affecting uh, where people live right around the time that a smoke free air law is put into place. Okay, so uh, table three here shows the first set of results. And all of these coefficients are going to be relative to, to the number one. So uh, in column one here for ages 18 to 64, for the CC tax variable, we see that that's a coefficient of 1.015. Um, so all numbers above one are gonna be an increase in, um, in the outcome variable. And all numbers less than one are gonna be a decrease. So for CC tax of 1.015, this would be a 1.5% increase in acute myocardial infarction as a result of or associated with conventional cigarette taxes. Um, so we see for acute myocardial infarction, there's no significant changes um, after each of these tobacco control policies are put into place. Uh, but we do see that for acute cerebrovascular disease in column two for the age of 65 plus, there is a 2.4% uh, percent decrease in the number of um, strokes after smoke-free air laws are put into place. And then uh, the, the bottom uh, diagnosis group there, hip fracture, is, um, is our specification check. 
and it does not change significantly as a result of either tobacco control policy, uh, which is reassuring. So uh, we're more confident the effect that we see for smoke-free air laws on acute cerebrovascular disease is actually you know, a, a true effect. And so uh, table four now shows the effect of new versus established laws. So here again, I've, I've swapped out the single smoke-free air law variable and replaced it with two variables for the first year that a law was put into place, which is new laws and then established laws is all subsequent years after that. So um, it gives us a better idea of how these laws are changing um, or the, the health benefits resulting from these laws, how they change over time. So again, while we don't see any significant effect on acute myocardial infarction, um, there is, you know, from new laws to established laws, um, it is kind of trending in the, the direction that we would expect. So essentially no change um, from new laws, but over time in the ages 65 to plus category, we have a coefficient of 0 0.975, so a 2.5% decrease in acute myocardial infarction as a result of established smoke-free air laws. Um, so, you know, not statistically significant, but reassuring that it's in the, in the correct direction and that it's increasing over time. However, for acute cerebrovascular disease, we see that it has both a significant decline right away, so a 2% reduction in uh, stroke hospitalizations as a result of new laws, new smoke-free air laws. And then as a result of established laws, um, it increases to 2.8% uh, decline. So there's an immediate benefit right away, uh, which grows to 2.8% you know, in the years following implementation. And uh, you know, conventional cigarette tax, um, again, just like the previous slide is not significant in either of these specifications. And then finally, uh, the, um, the specification check here of hip fracture reassuringly is not changing significantly as a result of either new laws or established smoke beer laws. Okay, so the additional specification check um, where I separately estimate the impact of each individual year leading up to and following smoke-free air law implementation. Uh, the coefficients are charted here. So the vertical red line that you see is the first year, year zero, uh, when the smoke-free air law is put into place. So we would expect, hopefully, to see in the years leading up to that, um, nothing changing significantly from the baseline, which would be one. So uh, reassuringly, we see that um, for the four years leading up to these policies, you know, none of these coefficients are, are changing or are deviating significantly from that baseline level. So the conclusions here, um, we see that smoke-free air laws um, are associated with a significant reduction in acute cerebrovascular disease among older adults and these declines uh, become larger over time. So larger declines from established laws. And there's also no significant change in acute myocardial infarction from either tobacco control policy. Uh, we do see you know, reassuring evidence that, uh, that these uh, heart attacks possibly decline over time, uh, but you know, we're not significant, uh, statistically significant. Um, you know, these estimates, if we're thinking about how they compare to previous research, um, you know, they're, they're in line with some of the national level analyses and uh, some of the previous research looking at, you know, 20 or 30 states or, you know, examining Medicaid data or Medicare data. Um, but they are, you know, obviously smaller than some of the single city analyses um, or comparing, you know, a handful of states here to a handful of states there. Um, one possible reason for this might be um, that this study includes those extra controls for local and county conventional cigarette taxes, as well as tobacco control spending. Um, so this might reduce omitted variable bias. If those variables were instead excluded, um, you know, we saw from one of the summary stats slides that counties that implement smoke-free air laws are also implementing cigarette taxes and the states that they're in also spend more on tobacco control uh, funding. 
And so, uh, you know, if we had omitted them, the effect of those might be placed on smoke-free air laws um, and, and bias the estimates away from zero. So uh, that's one possible reason why the estimates here are, are smaller than some of the smaller scale studies um, in the literature. You know, that's not to say that this study is without uh, possible bias. You know, examining um, the number of hospitalizations at the county level, I don't know, um, you know, individual exposure to each of these policies. So, you know, I'm assuming that, um, that everyone is only exposed to the tobacco control policy in their county of residence. So if you live in one county and work in another county, um, the effect of smoke free laws in that other county, um, I'm gonna assume has no effect on you. You're only impacted by uh, your county of residence, the policies uh, that exist in your county of residence. Um, the, there's also, it's also possible that there's informal smoking bans that exist prior to these formal laws being put into place. Um, and this would bias the estimates here towards zero because we're assuming that there's nothing in place beforehand. Um, but you know, if the health benefits have already accrued in the years before, when you know, the company you work for says, you're not allowed to smoke here, there's an immediate health benefit right after that. And then a few years later, a smoke free air law comes into place. And so not much is happening when the actual uh, law is put into place. So this might bias the estimates that bind towards zero. Um, and then finally, um, I assume that there's no other tobacco control policies enacted at the same time. I include that measure of tobacco control spending to kind of as, be a catch all for other factors, um, other tobacco control policies. But if there are other tobacco control policies put into place, which also uh, reduce heart attacks and strokes, uh, then the estimates that I find might be biased away from zero. Um, and so they might be here larger than they, than they actually are. Um, there was an Institute of Medicine um, study out in 2010, however, you know, that noted um, that other tobacco control policies were only seldom enacted alongside smoke-free air laws. So that should, um, you know, reduce concern that there's something else working out there that I'm not accounting for. And so what are the implications of this study? So we saw that expansion of smoke-free air laws and maybe optimistically including conventional cigarette taxes um, have some potential, potential health benefits, at least as far as stroke and heart attacks are concerned. Um, but there's also opportunities for additional tobacco control policies moving forward. As I mentioned earlier, as of last year, nearly 40% of the US population is not covered by smoke-free air laws in work sites, restaurants, and bars. And the state conventional cigarette tax is as low as 17 cents per pack. Um, you know, also there's very few localities, I believe in Alaska and maybe one other state um, that tie the conventional cigarette tax to inflation. And so it's automatically increased each year. And so across the US, essentially the cigarette tax is decreasing in real terms year over year. Um, and so uh, it's important or might be important for policymakers in these states to consider uh, tying the conventional cigarette tax to keep up with inflation, um, which might lead to, to increased health benefits down the road. And with that, I will turn it back over to, I believe Mike. Yep. Great. See, any concluding discussion comments? Yeah, I think I really enjoyed the talk. Um, there are many good questions coming in Q&A, so I only have one last question. Uh, so I know that you're looking at just the uh, um, smoke free air laws uh, that being cigarette smoking, but um, I think towards the end of your study period, like 2014, we see e-cigarettes becoming more popular. So I'm just wondering, like, if you in the future expand the study, how would address how would you address the um, uh, the vaping policies, uh, smoke free air laws, like regulating uh, vaping as well? Thanks. Yeah. Um, so. You could, I think pretty, it would be pretty straightforward to also include um, vaping policies. You know, the data certainly exists on the enactment date and where these uh, policies take place. Um, you know, one, I guess this would probably be a minor point, but figuring out if you're looking before 2015 and after 2015, um, somehow uh, mapping hospitalization codes, the ICD-9 codes to ICD-10 codes, 
um, so you have a, a consistent comparison or you're consistently identifying your outcome variable across those time periods. But, um, you know, conventional cigarette taxes, um, I think the, the research has shown that they're much more dangerous than uh, e-cigarettes. And so I would expect the health benefits to be much larger for a smoke-free air law versus a vaping ban, say. Um, so you might be able to, you could certainly study, you know, the effects of a vaping ban on heart attack or stroke or asthma or something. Um, I might expect the, the findings to be smaller than, than for smoke free was, but um, I guess we'll see. Yeah, look forward to seeing the results. <laughs> Hey, thank you, C. Um, yeah, some great, great questions in the Q and A. Feel free to add your own uh, if you would like. Um, John, there's um, a question uh, about if you have considered the change in work flexibility during this studied uh, uh, period. Um, maybe fewer people were able to work from home in the earlier years of your analysis, but then in the later years, more people were able to work from home, and um, if, if that could affect your results at all. And how do you think this could be addressed if there is changes in um, working from home behavior over time? Um, I mean, I do include time fixed effects, so it will, you know, absorb the impact of, of general trends over time. Um, I don't know, I mean, I don't know what the, if there was any big shifts in working from home from 2005 to 2014, there very well could have been, um, but it, also if there's data that exists on, you know, what portion of the state, each state or each county or something is able to work from home. Um, yeah, I, I didn't, um, I hadn't thought of that, but um, yeah, I mean, if, if people were like systematically able to, to work from home more often or something, then I would, I would miss capturing that in the study, but um, you know, any general time trends, it might be uh, grabbed by the, the time fixed effects. Okay. Um, it, are there any, um, any laws uh, passed in the various states that you believe are particularly effective in terms of the outcomes you study? I don't know if you did any kind of, uh, I don't know, drop, like drop one at a time, one state at a time or anything like that, in which maybe you noticed that there were a few states that seemed particularly important to the results. Um, not looking at, um, like one state at a time. I mean, part of, I think the reason that I went with an average of all three of these policies is, you know, they're very often enacted together. Um, I would think that like workplace laws would have the largest effect because, you know, nearly everyone spends time in the workplace, whereas only a fraction of the population would then go to a bar or restaurant after work. Um, I vaguely recall, uh, you know, including each of these policies separately, um, and they would kind of offset each other because they're, they're always or almost, uh, I should say frequently enacted alongside each other. So, um, using an average of the three was kind of a straightforward way to, um, to capture their, their joint effect. Um, but I would assume that that workplace laws would have the largest impact of the three, just because that's where most of the population spends their time. Okay. Um, <clears throat> there's a suggestion to uh, also um, look at smoking uh, in addition to these um, these health outcomes. Is that something that you considered uh, doing at all? Yeah. Um, looking at the smoking rate, there was. Um, I think part of the problem was was getting a hold of county level data during this time period. Um, there was a study that had um, imputed or predicted county level smoking rates um, for all of these years. Um, and I think I went down the road a little bit at one point looking at those outcome variables, but I think certainly at the state level, it's probably much easier to get uh, that data over a certain number of years. Um, so that could definitely be, you know, additional work moving forward, looking at how the smoking rate changes. Um, but yeah, I think the, the main hurdle was uh, collecting all that data at the county level for 2005 to 2014. Um, 
the uh, the Nielsen retail scanner data, I wonder if that's a potential source, right? I think they have ability to see county level sales there at least, right? Um, maybe that's the, the best we can do. The the, Bur the Burfus, I think, has counted through 2012, right? But nothing beyond uh, beyond beyond that point. Um, uh, one other uh, question in the Q&A right now. Um, wouldn't adults 65 plus be least likely to spend time in spaces covered by smoke-free laws, workplaces, bars? Any speculation on what would explain why you're picking up an effect specifically in older adults? Yeah, so the, um, yeah, I mean, the 65 plus population would be less likely to spend time in workplaces, but maybe more likely to spend time in restaurants or bars. Um, you know, follow up analysis could certainly look at um, those individual policies differently for each age group. Um, it just didn't happen to be something that I, I had looked at for, for this study. But yeah. Um, you could separately estimate the working age adults for uh, for work sites and an older population for the non work site areas. Um, maybe getting back to the, the casino comment from earlier, you know, including other locations besides work sites where older adult, adult adults might spend more time. Okay. Um, uh, see Sheng added in a, another quick comment to the uh, to the chat. Um, uh, mentioning um, a cosmetic suggestion that um, uh, you're showing relative risks, but the standard errors possibly are coefficient. Uh, beta C, did you wanna? Did you wanna? Yeah. Articulate so your point. Yeah, I just I'm I'm becoming lazy <laughs> these days when reading tables. So I usually just look at the coefficients and standard errors, and I notice that your standard errors are quite small. In, uh, relative to the coefficients real report. So like when people don't read pe uh, the table carefully, they may conclude that uh, all of your coefficients are significant. So I know you're reporting relative risk, but I suspect that the, uh, the center errors are for the beta coefficient in the uh, Poisson distribution. So just some minor suggestion. Um, I know it's already published. I think we were said, okay. So, <laughs> but I guess I'm just uh, from my like, Sometimes, as a lazy reader, um, it may have maybe more um, helpful to kind of like uh, for the audience to uh, better understand what the table is, is saying. So it's just a very minor issue. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, and the the you know it could be due to also you know the data availability by uh, time. Um, if a if a you know hip fracture you know. Uh, I think was from maybe one or two fewer states. Um, so there might be a little bit broader um, standard errors on that measure versus some of the others, but yeah, I'll take another look at that, thanks. Um, John, uh, I, I just had uh, two, two questions. Um, one is, um, is you're, you're mentioning that uh, your estimates might be a little bit lower than prior literature. And, and I guess, I think the prior literature might only have been on smoke-free air loss. I don't know if anybody has looked previously at the effect of cigarette taxes on these outcomes. At least I can't remember seeing that from your um, your early slide. Is that accurate or have there been cigarette tax studies as well on these types of health outcomes? Um, usually alongside the smoke-free air loss, it's almost always the state level cigarette tax mm -hmm. uh, might be included as a control. Um, there was um, I think it was a more 1996 paper looked at uh, mortality as a as a result of cigarette taxes uh, from like the 50s through the 80s and found a decline. Um, yeah, there it would be very small number of studies that looked at um, or any that looked at local and county cigarette taxes as part of this. I think okay. so uh, it might be just at the state level. Yeah. You're breaking kind of new ground on on, on that then, um, and um, finding basically null effects on that uh, for that policy. Um, and then I guess one final, uh, just kind of cons a big picture question. Uh, just you work for ASPE, and and I was just curious if this is something that they're particularly interested in um, uh, indoor air laws. I, I know you mentioned this was part of your dissertation research, uh, so maybe that's not implying that ASPE has any interest in. 
this area, but I was just curious if they are interested in anything tobacco related that we might benefit from knowing about um, as a group of tobacco control researchers and uh, advocates. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm always trying to pitch uh, additional tobacco research going forward. I think, you know, there's a big um, concern now with the opioid public health crisis. And so um, a lot of my research, a couple of research projects underway looking at at that, the growing number of deaths from opioids. Um, but certainly I'm always uh, pitching research ideas and have gotten the green light on uh, a few going forward for, for tobacco research. So, um, yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, John. Um, then I will uh, kick it back over to Catherine to take us out. We are out of time. Thank you for to our presenter, moderator, and discussant. Finally, thank you to our audience of over 100 people for your participation. We hope you have a top-notch weekend.